Okay, folks, we'll, uh, we'll make a start. We have a busy schedule. And I'll, uh, I'll make a start by welcoming uh, everybody, really, uh, those of you who are attending uh, in person and those attending uh, online, which is by far the greater majority. I think we have about 110 uh, people joining us, uh, joining us online today. And, uh, and they're all very welcome. Uh, I want to begin with a bit of a sober or a somber note, really, I suppose, and just say, look, we have kind of framed today's event as being about the legacy of emergency remote teaching. Um, but we'd like to acknowledge, I suppose, that people have uh, suffered a lot more hardship than having to teach and learn at a distance uh, as a result of the pandemic. So just to acknowledge that and that might be something that we, uh, that we end up uh, coming back to again. Um, it's been a while since I've done this, but uh, I'm also obliged to tell you about uh, fire exits and toilets uh, of less interest, obviously, to people who are joining us online. So in the unlikely event of there being a fire, we will, unless you're told otherwise, be heading out that way. If you're looking for toilets, it's across the foyer. You pass them on your way here. Uh, so you go out that door turn left and go left again. Um, if you have any issues uh, during the seminar, if you need help with anything, just raise your hand and uh, Niall or Christelle or somebody will, uh, will, will be over to you. So we're running until 12 o'clock. As I say, we have a busy schedule. At that stage, there'll be tea and coffee out in the foyer. Uh, if you wish, though, you can come back at half past 12 if you haven't already heard enough uh, from our two visitors, you can come back at half past 12 for a bit more of a chat. And so those of you attending both in person and online can use, I think we're going to bring up uh, a URL there, uh, can use a particular URL to, uh, to submit your questions. So we'll keep that poll open uh, over the course. Uh, maybe it's coming up for a while over the course uh, of, the, uh, of the event. There you go. So slido.com, and uh, that's, the, that's the code. It, it'll work fine on your, on your mobiles as well, uh, if, if that's something that you have with you. And that's the particular hashtag that we're using for this event as well. So if we have any Twitter users with us, uh, you, can, uh, you can use that hashtag as a sort of a back channel uh, to say things about us uh, during, during the event. Uh, now there, as I said, we have, uh, we have a busy schedule and uh, very glad to, uh, to welcome Michael Loftus, Vice President for External Affairs, to uh, say a few words by way of opening this event. So over to you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Gerard. Absolutely uh, delighted to be here. Um, I am representing the President this morning, who was scheduled to be here, but whose flight was diverted. Um, I think it would have been a, an interesting experiment in practice if we'd asked the President to deliver virtually from her telephone while sitting on a diverted uh, airport runway, but um, uh, not for today, maybe for uh, some day in the future. So. Welcome to everybody. A very special welcome to our two visiting speakers, Dr. Dana Lankless and Professor Laurie Phipps, and two visitors from the other institutes and universities who are joining us today. A particular welcome to our online audience. Uh, I know that the colleagues who have organized today's event have made a great effort to ensure that those who are here in person and those who are attending online get uh, as equivalent an experience as possible from the event. I think it's absolutely the correct way to go and the most strategic way to go. And I want to congratulate colleagues for uh, working in that manner and uh, hopefully delivering an event in that way that will, uh, won't lose any sense of presence or engagement for all involved. Uh, we're back on campus. Uh, it's interesting after a two-year period to be at an event like this. It's my first time at an event like this in that uh, period of time. For many colleagues, there's a wonderful aspect to be back, but there are incredible learnings that we can take from the time that has just passed. I really hope that uh, today's event will maybe highlight both the, uh, the uh, wonderful things that are to be had from in-person engagement and in-person learning, and also 
what we've learned from this recent period that will make a significant and sustainable contribution to what we do in learning, teaching, uh, engagement, research and innovation into the future. Uh, we did a staff survey in December last and the findings were very interesting. I suppose uh, in speaking with Gerard and colleagues, Tom and colleagues, the, uh, it was interesting that hardly anyone or any member of our staff wanted to return to 100% face-to-face -face learning and teaching, and hardly anyone wanted to go to 100% online learning and teaching. So there's a, a spectrum there in the middle. And clearly, this, uh, this great experiment that's happened in recent times as a consequence of COVID has brought uh, insights and learnings and views and opinions to colleagues that were uh, are informed, the uh, framing of opinions, which have now uh, come back to us by way of a staff survey and which we would be foolish not to take account of as we go forward. I want to thank uh, Christina Pinkaro for her work on the infographic summarizing that survey information. Thanks to Gerardo Suleran and Tom Fowley on our Cork and Kerry campuses who will both be uh, engaging with us as we work through this morning's event in relation to uh, uh, determining how we can translate these survey findings into strategic and uh, impactful action. Uh, I'm told we're also today going to have some video footage that was recorded in November of the year just gone by, which captures the views and opinions of staff based on their experiences of learning and teaching during the pandemic. And that's very positive. I want to thank Shane Cronin and Brendan Flaherty from the Department of Technology Enhanced Learning for their work on this uh, series and essentially it's a great document of MTU's so-called great online-learning. Um, Shane and Brendan, thank you also for your technical support for today's event. Having said all that, the two main stars of today are our visitors, Dr. Donna Lankless and Professor Laurie Phipps. Donna, I'm informed uh, by Donna and others, is no stranger to Cork and studied uh, in UCC back in the day. Um, and I'm told Donna's a big uh, lover and drinker of Barry's tea. So already we're seeing some, uh, I'm not sure Donna, if you'd ever have developed a love of Barry's tea, if your entire experience with us had been virtual. So uh, something to, to reflect on there. Um, Dr. Langless has also recently become a member of adjunct faculty with the Department of Technology Enhanced Learning and amongst other things is helping the department better understand and research as staff and students are engaging with digital technology in their teaching and learning practice. So welcome, Donna. Professor Phipps, I believe, has not been to Cork before, so we're delighted to welcome you in person. I'm sure you've had much uh, uh, virtual online technology enhanced engagement in times past, and it'll be interesting to, to uh, hear from you in person at today's event. Larry is a senior research lead at JISC, which is a well-known source of expertise and advice in the UK on all things digital in higher education, originally set up uh, and ran a service within JISC in 2001 to advise staff and supporting disabled students through technology and continues to have a keen interest in matters of access and inclusion. Topics that I've heard many com colleagues commentate or comment on in relation to what technology enhanced learning brings by way of giving us new tools in our arsenal on that front. So, we very much uh, welcome the insights and contributions of our two visitors at this important uh, juncture for our university. As you know, we're in the middle of developing our strategic plan. I'd be delighted if we have outcomes from today's event, which feed into our strategic planning and make us a better university uh, going forward. I want to thank everybody who's involved in the organization of the event. Thank you all for attending here in person. I understand there's 100 to 200 people online. We want to thank you all for uh, participating as well. So on that note, I'll conclude my comments. Thanks for the invitation to participate, Gerard, and every best wishes to colleagues as they uh, go forward with today's event. Thank you. That's great, uh, Michael. Thanks very much for that, uh, for that introduction. So next up, we have a video and a poll, uh, P-O-L-L. The... Uh, the video was something we shot back in November of last year. Uh, Michael just mentioned it there. 
seems like a long time ago now, and it was part of a funded initiative to capture the experiences of people up and down the organization, really, um, in terms of teaching and learning during the pandemic. So um, we're going to, I was hoping it was Roisin was going to be playing the video so I could get to say, roll it there, uh, Roisin. But in advance of that, whoops, sorry, I missed my mark. Uh, in advance of that, we're going to ask people um, to start a poll or to, to reply to a poll where like a lot of these people here will be talking about various different benefits, I suppose, that they noticed and uh, different ways in which they felt that emergency remote teaching brought, uh, brought value. Uh, so as you're watching the video, maybe have a think yourselves about any of the benefits that you think may have existed. We're not saying it was all good, and we will be talking about many of the challenges and the work still to be done. In fact, there's a poll on that very topic in a while. But right now, for both our in-person and our online attendees, I'm asking people to take part in this poll, which you can see here. So which, if any of the following do you see as positives or benefits, and you, it's entirely open for you to say no real benefits are, are positives, okay? So we'll get back to the results of that afterwards. This is one of the ways, I suppose, in which we're trying to bring the, the online group and the in-person group together. So your, uh, your participation is, uh, is appreciated. Okay, so roll it there, Rogine. Let's, uh, yeah. let's have a look at that video. throughout the, the period of the last 18 months, we have had to be responsive and, and flexible in our programme delivery and how we deliver our programmes in relation to our teaching, learning assessment and student engagement strategies. I could zoom in and observe their work. I could observe it really closely, hear everything that they said, watch their movement patterns very clearly. In the normal gym environment, I'm observing from a distance, I mightn't catch everything that they say. For me, being able to access national and international speakers and be able to invite them as guest lecturers and panellists, which I wouldn't have been able to do before that as easily. The use of technology in teaching has totally improved their capacity to access um, the teaching environment and um, students reported that they didn't need so many to ask for so many accommodations around their assignments, exams, even in the teaching experience. Breakout rooms on Zoom. We were able to adapt to that. Lecturers got students engaging by turning on their cameras and turning on their mics and using breakout rooms to engage with each other. So that was brilliant. Reach Academic Mentoring allows lecturers, 85 of them, to connect in with 3,500 mentees across our first years and second years across our campuses. Well, academics really rose to the challenge in a really short period of time to put in place a set of alternative learning and assessment strategies for those students for whom unfortunately placement couldn't go ahead as they had hoped. Encrypting the laptops and, and automating the imaging process I think was one of, the, one of the big things we needed to resolve. Obviously there was a skeleton staff on campus during, um, during the pandemic so we had to be efficient um, and as resourceful as possible with the resources that we had. The role of the lecturer has changed now from being simply delivering content to curating uh, content that's out there available, picking the most appropriate pieces and including them in, in their study. Now I have students with me in person but I still record very key concepts, very short videos which they can go back to and revise if they miss the concept in class. There is an opportunity to having a kind of a blended approach to what we do, not just with teaching, but also with things like meetings, you know, maybe one-to-one -one supervision with students, dissertation meetings worked very well online. They have the best of both worlds. They're, they're with their own group in the incubator and they're accessing the training and mentoring with the group who have a product or service in their own area. I think the initial briefing from the client, uh, elements of that could be brought forward. I think that can be conducted very effectively in the online setting. There is no need for the client to come into the classroom setting uh, to conduct that oral briefing. I think that has worked very, very well. Meetings where we would have had to travel a lot, long distance in the past to meet each other from different campuses, we now do those online. So effectively, we've, we've eliminated travel the un unnecessary travel at the very least and you know there's environmental impacts 
associated with that. From a staff point of view is how to look after students who need to have a, a meeting with a team of their lecturers if they're in some kind of difficulty and we've learned that it's perfectly feasible through a, a webinar rather than face to face. There's an opportunity to carry forward uh, remote teaching, remote learning in a way that's blended with in-person learning. Uh, this provides people with a great opportunity to minimise their carbon footprint, learn from home, to ensure that disadvantaged regions have the same access to education, uh, while also retaining the benefits of in-person learning for uh, group learning, for leadership development and the development of good communication skills in our students and graduates. To everybody who uh, was involved in the video, I can see uh, some, some people here and uh, I know a few people who are, who are tuning in online as well who also um, participated. Let's maybe have a, look, a quick look at those poll results and see how they chime with some of the things that we heard in the, in the video. Okay, so I'm seeing some of it here and some of it here. Okay. So uh, in terms of positive, greater flexibility, which of course can mean so many different things, uh, there's so many different kinds of flexibility, it seems to be number one, ability to work from home, number two, less travel, no travel, uh, and better life work balance. I don't know if we can scroll down and see if anybody was indicating if there was no benefits. Zero percent. Okay, so we're not we're not suggesting it was all benefits, but it is interesting that nobody indicated that there was no benefits. Now, just in case you think we're avoiding the negatives, time for poll number two. So, Rogine, if you're able to bring up the second poll or the text of it, there, yeah. What challenges or obstacles uh, do you see with respect to an increased use by staff of digital technology for teaching? learning and assessment, okay? So an increase, I suppose, over and above um, pre-COVID times, if you like, because obviously there was quite a lot of digital technology getting used. Okay, so that's your, that's your second poll. While you're responding to that one, I'm going to invite Tom Farley to uh, come on stage, the real, the real and virtual stage, and uh, tell us about the survey that Michael already uh, referred to. So over to you. Uh, Tom, if you want. Yeah, exactly. It's um, smaller. I have to move it down. But no, <laughs> these are strange things I haven't had to get used to. And, and as, as Michael and Groda said, it's, it's strange being here. So, um, yeah, we, we undertook a, a survey uh, in December, uh, sort of keen to see what the, uh, the staff would be. So I'm just waiting. And here we are. Uh, so yeah, so it's a survey of emergency world teaching and, and those models. So on the first slide here, uh, just to sort of say it overall, it was pretty well representative of the, the staff distribution, but we have all, all of the uh, the campuses uh, represented. So it's, it's really interesting for us to, to get that, that overall picture. And as you can see, we 283 people. Um, I think in particular here, I mean, internet reliability, and we just done a comparison here between the May and December, um, but we have to be careful, like not the exact same 283 people answered, but it still certainly shows, I think, it's one of the things which is, I suppose, is beyond the, the, the remit of the college to some degree at a national level, the need for the, the that um, internet connectivity. But as we'll be discussing later, I think it's it's far more than just internet connectivity. Uh, on the next slide, then we, we ask people then what were the benefits, which just ties in there. And as I said, like you know, as you can see here, that over eighty percent thought there, there were benefits with eighteen point seven percent no benefits whatsoever. And I think as I said, that that's one of the things. I suppose with any sort of survey, we're not going to be drilling down into the the why. It was just to get a sense of that. But I think that's something that you know we need to take account of. But I think in a lot of surveys, if I got eighty percent uh, happiness, you know, I'd, I'd be I'd be fairly happy with that. And, and the next slide, then. Um, the next slide. Yeah, sorry. So, you know, what were the benefits for them here? And I think like Michael and, and Tim Daly talked, you know, even about the, the impact on the environment here, like no travel or less travel there and, and time saves and, and traveling and, and commuting. And when you consider that, you know, both for staff and for students, we are in a, a very large geographical spread area. So, for some people, that can mean quite a significant uh, benefit. 
obviously the ability uh, to work from home and the flexibility which just topped our poll there and as I said specifically on the reduced carbon footprint and I think that's sort of indicative of the SDGs and I think our general awareness which I, I suspect you know if we asked that question 10 years ago a carbon footprint may not have been you know it's sort of as high up as there like that so that's the uh, the top 10 benefits on the next slide then um as i said we just continued on here all the way down here the ability to record lectures um so as you can see here their own digital skills i think that's another thing there which has come out of it either way i think we certainly crossed the rubicon to use that that well hackneyed phrase that uh, i think there's no there's no sort of putting the, the whole um online in back into into the box so i think as i said that's it's been all very, all very, very positive. The, the next slide then, we just have the, the first challenges. And I think, as I said, it is important that, that we do acknowledge uh, those challenges there. And I think for some people, just that level of motivation and engagement, particularly as people are working from home. I mean, I think that one thing that we're all here now physically this morning, and that sort of social aspect of, of, of stuff there, um, the challenges of doing assessments and so on there, um, and the personal home life uh, interference, and I, I think certainly I would have known colleagues who have, you know, a far more crowded house than I have, and, and younger children and stuff there like that. The worst I had to contend with was dogs barking in the, in, in the background, so I suppose that was the, the big thing for me. So as I think, and as I said, we're going to be discussing there about about the uh, the challenges there, and I, I think that's it then. Uh, just this final. Uh, as I said, what's the impact on teaching and learning support practices? And I think, uh, I suppose, from the tell and, and colleagues and Ed too here, I suppose, the, the, you know, I said, if field experiences, remote teaching will have a lasting impact on, on, on their teaching and learning support practices. And I think that's the thing here, the legacy. I think both myself and Goro were speaking, we're very wary of not saying it's all over. It's not, I think we've moved to a different phase. But I think there are going to be uh, benefits and, and, and sort of a, a lasting positive uh, impact. So I'm fairly sure, to, so it's oh yes, our class stop for considered to be the lasting impact. What do they look like? As I said, the greater use of online uh, technology, new ways to communicate. I know myself, certainly, I supervise students and I don't meet them one-to-one -one anymore. Well, I do, but not not face-to-face. -face. There's no point in someone driving in from Kilmallock for a half-hour meeting with me. Uh, just share the new ways of sharing the material and, and that sort of feedback there. And obviously, I think the new assessment practices, I think that's come true with some people. They have really embraced those new technologies. I'm mindful of the time. So um, I'll pass back now to Garod. And thanks very much. And thanks to all the people who participated in the survey. That's great, Tom. Uh, thanks very much. So we might just pop up the results of that second poll and then we'll uh, turn things over to our two speakers. So I don't know, Roisin, if you're able to give us the results of the live poll. There we go. So what are the challenges? Wow. So unstable and unreliable internet. That's some, definitely something we need to talk about with, with our guests. Lack of engagement by students. Ins insufficient budget or resources lack of strategic vision or leadership okay so i just leave it there but there's lots of stuff that we can we can clearly be getting into actually that probably segues quite 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 well into a question i had in mind for you donna if that's okay you actually did some work with us here uh, in the munster technological university before it was the munster technological university back in spring of 2020 so if we had just made the transition to emergency remote teaching. Do you want to tell us maybe a little bit about what people were experiencing back then and, and uh, what kind of findings you had from your, uh, from your research? Yeah, so it was uh, not the height of the pandemic, but it was probably the height of the panic around the pandemic. It was, we were talking to uh, lecturers, uh, both at the Cork uh, location also the truly location about what their practices were uh, now that everything was um, online and also an emergency. And um, there were several things that came out of it, but one of the things that I was struck by the most, in addition to concern about uh, technological questions, was the idea of whether or not they felt supported in doing these things that they knew they had to do, but were 
relatively unfamiliar to them. I did talk to some lecturers who were very practiced in teaching online. Um, CIT and I teach really at the time had extensive online teaching practices and learning practices. There were entire programs, you know, that are remote and have been since before the pandemic. So um, there was a great deal of experience and there was also a great deal of inexperience. The inexperienced staff members that I talked to said things to me like, well, I wasn't sure what I was doing, but I knew who I could talk to so that I could be confident in trying the things till I got to the point where it worked. Sometimes the people that they said they talked to were the teams um, at EDSU or um, the TEL team here. Sometimes they were trusted colleagues who they had a habit of talking to about teaching. So there are communities of practice that had been set up. So what I was really struck by as a researcher was that there was an, uh, an infrastructure of social connections that supported staff in doing the technological things that they needed to try, whether it was comfortable or familiar or not. So, so then the decision point was not, oh, I'm comfortable with this, so I'll do it, but was, well, I have to do this, and it's going to be weird, and people will help me. And I think that had a tremendous impact then on what they felt they could do with their students. Excellent. And how, how would that chime with maybe some of the research you've done over in the UK or some of the experiences you'd be, you'd be familiar with in, in a UK higher education context? I, I mean, all of that sounds really familiar. I think actually, are you just saying that? I think one of the key things that came out was the difference between help and guidance yeah. in the UK context. Um, and, you know, I've, I've looked at the research that you guys have done, and it seems to me that the staff here felt there was an awful lot of um, help, you know, people there to actually help people during the pandemic. And that was there in, in the UK context as well. But there was awful also uh, sometimes feeling a little bit lost because there was more guidance that people were being pointed to. And I think... Um, Donna used the phrase panic in the pandemic at some point. And I think when you're in a pan panic in the pandemic, you know, you don't always want that guidance. You know, sometimes you just want help, even if it's just somebody on the end of a phone to say, it's going to be okay. We had one lecturer say something to us in another project we did in the UK. I have 20 tabs open in my browser yeah. of videos that I could be watching to tell me what to do. But what I really need is somebody, to, somebody to sit with me while I talk about this thing that I need to do with my students on Tuesday. Yeah. Or in an hour. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and so having that help is really important. Yeah. And I think a culture of help is really important. I think some of the things that we also saw in the UK that came out strongly during the pandemic that's probably been there all the time, um, we saw female academics especially, and young female academics especially, being drawn into more pastoral conversations with students. There was more pressure on, on those academics to, to be somebody to listen to the students. We saw more minority academics being supportive for minority students. You know, that was, that's always been there, I think. But during the pandemic, it, it was really being surfaced. So there were things like that that were happening. And I think there was also a feeling of loss as well. Um, one academic that we, that we interviewed together, actually, um, they hadn't spoken to an adult, as it were. They lived alone. They hadn't speaking, spoken to anybody that wasn't a student in several weeks because they taught alone. They had a research area that they were doing alone and they were missing that casual interaction of walking around campus, talking to people, talking to administrators, talking to somebody that they knew. Um, and there was a feeling of loss. And, and they said to us, it's so nice to be speaking to somebody. Yeah, we were struck in, in the research that I did at MTU and also the, the work that I did with Laurie in the UK. The, the act of speaking to people about what they were going through was experienced as an act of care. Um, the research that we were doing, they experienced as care. That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And, um, and I think, to your point, Laurie, who lecturers are had a tremendous impact on what their experience was with their students in the pandemic. As you say, women 
tended to be identified more by students as people they could go to to ask for help, even if they were not their assigned advisors. And again, minoritized students, if they were black or Asian or um, some other racialized category, wanted to trust that the person they spoke to was going to help them. And I remember we were talking to a, a, a white male academic and he said something to the effect of, well, I haven't heard from many students, I assume they're fine. And that was a thing that we, that we, that we, we also identified. We, I mean, we're generalizing, but female academics would say things like, I've not heard from my students, I hope they're okay. Mm -hmm. And we'd hear male academics saying, I've not heard from my students, I think everything's going well. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, that's, that is a generalization. But the position but, of who they were had a real impact on what yeah. they perceived to be even yeah. the existence of a problem, whether there was a problem there or not. And so. that might also be subject-based as well. Yeah, there's more, to, you know, more work to be done. The, you know, STEM <laughs> subjects were also very much, I haven't heard from them, they must get it. They're probably okay, yeah. yeah. So, it, you know, there's all sorts of things to unpick with that. You talked about the different uh, experiences for, for different staff. And I suppose one of the sort of conceptual shorthands we've often used for different uh, differential experiences is this thing about the digital divide. And we saw something there about the internet connectivity, and certainly it appeared to be. But I mean, do you think like the term digital divide is a bit of an oversimplistic thing in terms of how different people experience and, and, and interact and the level of engagement that they have? I mean, all shorthand is a problem, right? Because it's collapsing a bunch of different things into a, a neat phrase. And, and I think in emergency situations, it's nice to think that we can encapsulate people's experiences into a neat phrase and think that we understand what's going on. My bias as an anthropologist is going to be to ask, what do you mean by that? Um, and so again, when we talk to, to staff, both in the MTU context, but also in the UK context, um, and as we saw in the poll, the personal context of connectivity and technical equipment had a huge impact on how they experienced their own teaching experience. And then, of course, as a knock-on effect to their students. So there was a, a student in England who we interviewed who was talking about a lecturer that she had who was clearly struggling. Um, and very few people in this large lecture course had their camera turned on. When we talk to students about why they do or don't use cameras, um, when they don't use cameras, it can be because of connectivity. Um, we've got a bunch of online participants here, and I can see there are not too many people who have cameras on. That doesn't mean they're not there. It just means that they don't have their camera on for privacy reasons. There are lots of different reasons uh, that students would not have their camera on. But the lecturer was clearly not being supported in dealing with engaging with students, whether the camera was on or not. And so that lecturer was taking in camera as a proxy for engagement and was so unsupported that they ended up just shouting at the students, just turn your cameras on. And so this student experienced that, of course, in a, in a very negative way. But the staff member was having a terrible experience and didn't know what to do. And it wasn't about the technology. It was just about they didn't know how to even feel connected to their students in the absence of a camera. And I think people who are extremely online might have more experience in generating engagement and engaging experiences in the absence of visuals. It's also a very ableist thing to suggest that the only way you can engage with somebody is if you can see them. So there's work there to, to be done as well around supporting staff. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just to go back to Tom's point about the digital divide, yeah. it's, it's not a useful phrase. Yeah. You know, and in, in the UK, um, successive governments have, have sort of, you know, tried to address this by going digital by default, um, which is actually excluding people because, you know, we, we put things online and, and say, well, they're freely available online. Well, they're only freely available online if you've got connectivity. They're only freely available online if you've got a device, you know. Digital default, digital divide exists, but it exists not in in digital terms. It exists in poverty terms. You know, if you can't afford it, then you can't access it. And I think that's the real issue. The real issue isn't the digital divide; it's the structural divides that we put in place. But to go to the engagement issue, just to if I can have an aside, um, we were interview. I was interviewing students. I've been interviewing black and Asian and minority students um, for a different project, and. I was asking them, you know, what do they do in lectures, face-to-face -face lectures, physical lectures. And they say things like, 
well, I go in, I don't really want to be noticed. So they'll go into a lecture and depending on who they are, and also depending on, on what kind of a student they are in terms of where they're from, what their cultural background is, they say things like, well, I go in, I want to listen. I'm paying attention, but I, I try and keep my head down, take the notes, and then I'll go back and I'll, I'll digest them. And it could be gender-based, it could be culturally-based, it could be, you know, which, which country they're from. You know, there's a tendency to think that there's, it's a blanket statement for different minorities, and it's not. Um, but then when I interview lecturers and I say face-to-face, -face, what does engagement look like? They say things like, they're the students at the front asking questions. They're the students at the huddle at the end. They're the students that I can see wanting to ask me something. And they're the students, you know, talking to each other about what I'm saying. Well, culturally, that's probably white males sitting at the front. Mm -hmm. It's culturally, there's a certain group of students that feel able to do that. I mean, if you're an international student, you know, you're coping with a different language. I mean, you know, not being funny, but, you know, I've got, thankfully I've got Donna translating for Tom for me today. Um, but but it's, it can be as simple as the, I mean, I say that jokingly, but, you know, if you've been to the UK and, you go in, and you're going to Newcastle, for example, as an international student, and there's a local lecturer with a, a Geordie accent, you know, that can be, you could spend all of your cognitive time just trying to process what that person's saying. So, it looks like you're not actually engaging. And so there's a the real issue about what we think student engagement is. Yeah. And that camera issue became a proxy for engagement because well, we yeah. feel we need a proxy for engagement. Well, and it's evidence that we don't actually know what engagement looks like in any context. We make assumptions. We think, those of us who teach, think that we can tell by looking whether a student is engaged. We might be correct, but often we're not because engagement looks a variety of different ways. I spoke to a student yesterday who said that she didn't like the lecturer that she had during her time at university. And the lecturer, and when she looked away, the lecturer used to pick on her and say, why aren't you paying attention? And so during lectures, and this was a long time ago, and she's mature now. And she said to me, what I did was, these text-heavy slides that the lecturer put up, I would just count the vowels in them so it looked like I was paying attention <laughs> and she wouldn't pick on me. And that was said to me yesterday about somebody's experience. And they hung on to that, right? Yeah. So the, that lecturer thought they were doing their job and making the student pay attention. And yeah. I remember when I was an undergraduate, you, you, they would have the student papers instead of their phones, but that was part of how we would be distracted yeah. in large lecture classes, right? And so the, the problem of a distraction, the problem of attention, right? Of who's, who's paying attention and what are they paying attention to is, is again something that I think really needs to be worked on in a professional context around support of lecturers. I think that some of the anxiety around, are they listening to me? Do they understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And they're making these assumptions in part because they don't have the training around pedagogy yeah. to, to be able to have any other signifiers uh, and of that what was, that would And that be. student I was talking to, was, that was 20 years ago. And I don't think things have changed that much. Not enough. Okay. Um, just to bring things back then, yeah. I mean, th th there's... I mean, there's a lot that we have to account for in terms of our, our digital frameworks, if you like, our digital learning frameworks. You mentioned digital by default uh, earlier. We've been kind of putting around this concept of digital by design, which is really about, I guess, consulting with staff and students to make sure that where, where digital is deployed, if you like, that it brings value, that it solves problems, is, is that something you're familiar with or something you can, you can talk a bit more about? I mean, in, in, so my organization, JISC, we, we built um, a digital capabilities framework. Um, but walking around MTU, and especially walking through this building, I noticed that on the wall, you have the frameworks there. And I think they're pre-pandemic frameworks, but they're still really valid. And it's like, you've got this digital by design um, ethos, I think, which is, I, I, guess, I guess it's digital with purpose. It's not about we're doing digital now. It's about we're doing digital and we're doing digital because we have a reason to. Is that fair? Is it, is it you know, we're going to find where it's going to work. That's where we're going to do it. But actually, there's a whole load of people up there that said, you know, that 18.7 that said, 
I don't think it works. Really. Well, they could be sports and recreation lecturers going, you know, I can't do this thing online. I need to get people in the gym. You know, so it's digital by design is about where it's appropriate, where it's useful, throwing a digital lens on what you do in teaching and learning and saying, right, these are the bits that are going to work. That's, that's what it means for me when you say digital by design. I say we've got a framework in the UK. It's been deployed across lots of universities. Um, but it's really just about supporting staff, supporting students in both their, their literacies for teaching and their literacies for using digital. Marrying those two things together is really powerful. And when somebody's a good teacher and you give them a good tool, you get a good outcome. So like when a friend of mine um, had said before, you know, you're automatically applying the digital lens. When you have a hammer, everything looks like looks like a nail. Yeah. 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 But, but here at MTU, you have um, the potential for sandbox type situations, right? Where in the context of strategic notions of digital and the digital by design that you've got, you also have spaces like this where you have opportunities um, for lecturers maybe to come in and say, I'm trying to do X with my students. What could I do? Um, and just give them a chance to play around with things. Um, those same spaces, I think, offer an opportunity for students to go in and just mess around with Kit and say, oh, I'm taking a course in such and so, right? This would be really good for this project that they want us to do or this presentation that we need to do. So I think that along with the notion of designing known things that you already have a sense of what should be done and that would be valuable, you want to have an opportunity to discover the things that didn't occur to you before. And if you have people and locations and time and resources uh, to have those sorts of opportunities open, then the potential for unexpected things to happen is, is just that much better. The, the sandbox is really important. Yeah. Um, are, are there any mathematicians in? There's a mathematician in. Mathematicians are the best storytellers. You know, they build up a story on a whiteboard and they actually have to do it. Blackboard. Whiteboard. <laughs> oh, blackboard. Chalk, White. yeah. I didn't want to use an LMS version. Chalk is Chalkboard. A big deal. <laughs> Chalkboard? Yeah, okay. But it's a story. Mathematicians tell a story. It doesn't really work in something like um, a presentation software, without naming one. Um, but it doesn't work as well. Um, and I was thinking it's really hard to do that online when you're trying to sort of project your slides onto a Zoom. But then, of course, I was walking down past your office yesterday, and you've got these things that just plug into a laptop, a USB, um, and what's it, what's it called with a document viewer? Is it DocuCam? Well, the Wacom, or is that what you're talking oh, about? No, the, 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 the DocuCam. Oh, yeah, yeah, the document camera. So you yeah. can put the DocuCam on a piece of paper for the for the person who's teaching mathematics or something like that. And from there, they can actually build up the formula and tell the story as they're going. And the, because there's a reveal for mathematicians, yeah. you know, they bury the lead. This is the formula that we're going to tell, mm -hmm. and this is how we're going to get to it. And they get to it, and they say, and look, this is how the whole thing works together, and they draw arrows back to it in the formula, <laughs> you know, because it's a story. And, you know, that, I've seen mathematicians teach in lecture theatres, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of theatre, you know, on a, on a blackboard. Mm -hmm. it, it's, well, and, the, and there's a lot that's lost if, yeah. if, if the approach to digital is we're going to digitize this, right? Yeah. Digitizing processes flattens things, doesn't pay attention to the nuance of practice, doesn't listen to the history of why you're doing things this way in the first place. But, but again, the, the digital by design, I've heard some uh, other CIO call it um, digitalization, right? This idea that um, it is not just about the technology, but about the behaviors and the processes that you're trying to engage in yeah. while you were doing this work. And this is what, what you're doing, I think. You know, when we talk about people saying everything's going online, we immediately start trying to put the mathematicians onto you know, that software. But actually, it's a really simple camera that you've got. That, digit it's, you're, that lecturer is now working digitally, but it's within the comfort zone of how they teach because they're still using a pen and paper and their students can still see it and they can see how it works and it's still digital. It's, it might not be, you know, high tech, you know, animations and you built the graphics six months in advance and got the, you know, 
the, the team and to sort of brand them all. It's somebody working off a bit of paper. It's still going over the internet, it's still making it accessible. You're reminding me of another thing that came out of the MTU stuff, and I, and I think it's important to point out here. Several people said to me, I thought that when I was teaching online, I would have to have it all really polished and well ahead of time, and it just didn't fit with how they thought they needed to teach. And in, in having to do it because it was an emergency, they realized that sometimes you just do a thing. And it's kind of quick and dirty, and it's not super sophisticated in terms of beautiful graphic design, but it is still effective because you are doing the thing and engaging in the process. And the digital tools help them do that because they had to, but the digital tools didn't determine or overdetermine how they did it. They just made it possible. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at the time here. So bringing it back to digital transformation, and no pressure, no lorry, but giving you kind of the last word on things, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's about more than just the technology, right? <clears throat> what are the other things we need to consider? We've covered a lot of them, and in a way we've been talking about digital transformation this whole time, but the technology is not enough, right? Sometimes we think giving people the technology or giving them the infrastructure will be sufficient. We, we see what, what, are, what are the different layers there, if you, if you like? It's digital transformation is, um, and, and I mean, you've got it on the slide there. The digital transformation is key. It's, um, it's, it's, not just, <laughs> it's not just about putting the tech in place. You know, you spend, you know, and we see it. We've seen institutions spend millions on infrastructure. But then you've got all this infrastructure sitting around and people going, well, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, it's about tra digital transformation for me is culture, it's technology, and it's resources and people. It's putting all of those things together and making sure that they work together. You can't put technology in place and not expect, and, and expect people to just go and use it. You've got to put the resource into the people. And when you start doing that, that's when you see the change. Digital transformation is about putting those things together and getting an outcome. Um, digital transformation is not about spending millions on infrastructure. That can help. I mean, you've got, you know, I don't know how far east you go. How far east do you go? Um, I suppose. Yeah, and how far west? Is that the whole of Ireland, almost, across one... Monster. Monster, no. No. The no. yeah. Los <laughs> University might disagree. <laughs> well, you've got this huge geographical spread, right? Um, and we talked earlier about access and access to infrastructure and access to digital divide, for example. I was in, um, I was in the Hebrides on holiday, um, working for GISC. I was in the Hebrides on holiday, and I was waiting for a ferry on a small island, and... I was like, I'm very relaxed now. I don't have to be back at work for another five days. Everything's really cool. And all of a sudden, my iPad started downloading hundreds of emails. And I was like, what is going on? And all of a sudden, I picked up Edgerome. And I was like, well, where's Edgerome coming from? I look around, there's a chippy. And above the chippy, I think it was a chippy. And above the chippy, there was a UHI logo. And it's like, I didn't work for UHI. But because I had Edgerome, I was able to access really fast broadband on my iPad on a small island waiting for a ferry to go to another small island. And I was thinking about that and about some of the communities that you work with, especially. You know, I know that Tom works with traveler communities, for example. Well, it, wouldn't it be great if you had people in areas between the West and the East coming to you and saying, do you know what, I've got a small space in a cafe. You know, is there any way you can put some sort of 5G in here with Edge of Rome so that students can come in and access that? Is there, any, is there a way that I can have, you know, MTU across all of these different community spaces mm -hmm. across, you know, the, the whole of, of the area? That's digital transformation. You know, it's, it's about having that technology infrastructure, having the community get involved with it and people seeing ways in. How do I see the spaces that I can get into university? Mm -hmm. And then having a culture of staff that say, great, now you can access it. And now what you can do 
is you can learn by using these techniques that I'm going to show you how. Mm -hmm. So you've got to support the staff to do that. And I think that's the real digital transformation is sort of widening the whole thing out, giving access to more people mm -hmm. and giving staff especially. You know, staff have to be the role models for how you teach online. We think that students come into university using, you know, Game Boys and that's an old That's text. a really old piece of You know what I mean? You know, there's this myth that they come in knowing <laughs> and they don't. So staff have to model the digital behaviours that you want to see in students. And when staff start modelling the digital behaviours that you want in students, then you get transformational learning outcomes. Then you start seeing real change. And then you start seeing changes in the community as well. That's access to higher education. But I, I think that to the MTU, the specificity of the MTU, you having Bally Ferder to y'all, you have uh, lecturers and students who are living in places that do not have 5G and the, you know, the connectivity piece of the poll is really significant. And, and again, I talked to one lecturer who said, if I lived across my own road, I would not be able to do the work from home that I need to do because the connection doesn't extend that far. And, and we heard from lecturers who were very aware that they also had students with that same situation, that they just simply did not have the connections. So yes, what is the role of community centers, of libraries, of cafes, um, of spaces that already exist um, that could become part of the, the greater presence of MTU across the landscape um, and truly be integrated into the lives of people, not just because they're participating in the institution, but because the institution, by providing resources and by providing opportunities, is integrating itself into the communities. Okay, so it's all about extending the, the reach of the university, but even the idea of the university across the, right. the, the region. I'm just looking at the time, I'm getting the sense people are shifting around a little bit. Yeah. So I we think can I, I, just, I just wanted to clarify um, <laughs> when, when Norian said new HR, it's the University of Highlands and Islands. So I just wanted to, yeah, just, yeah. I think, I think, and I think for, for the new uh, technological universities with large geographic spreads, I think possibly just something to, to learn from it's them. It's a great model, great, great exemplar. And I know you have a lot of links over there as well, Tom. Yeah. And I think it was mentioned a few times uh, back when we were originally applying for technological university status, actually. But listen, I just want to thank everybody for coming along. Uh, thank everybody who attended online. Thank uh, Michael for uh, slipping in there at the, at the, at the last minute. We um, have tea and coffee out in the foyer now, if people want to hang on. We, are, we have a bit of a, like a green room, if you like, at half past 12, if people want to come back and have a chat more with our, with our, with our speakers and, and with fellow attendees. And I think we had... Uh, and, and, and the online, I mean, because I said, we've been taking a lot of comments and stuff in. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we'd really love, if, if you've been online, you want to go off and grab a cup as well and come back and ask exactly. yeah. any of the questions that you posed. I mean, we really want you to feel proud of it. So we'll, be, we'll see everybody at half yeah, So we'll be gathering up those questions that, that, that people have been submitting. But uh, right now... Thanks very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much. And thank thanks. You. thanks for having us. Yes. Sorry, thanks for speaking. Thank you very much.